The story of the third confirmed interstellar object, 3i Atlas, has continued to develop throughout August, and much new data has come available. And while the object continues to generate interest and controversy, and does indeed show some interesting features that are a bit out of the ordinary, the object continues to develop characteristics that are consistent with a comet of interstellar origin. But in one way, the object is of great interest, and it's an aspect not really being talked about much amid the controversy and that is the motion of the object suggests an age of 7 billion years, meaning that it came from a star system considerably older than the solar system. We've never seen anything quite like that, though there are interstellar grains that have been found in meteorites and from the Stardust spacecraft that may also predate the solar system. But this would be an entire comet, and by watching the materials this object ejects, as it makes its way through the solar system, gives us a profile of what the star system of origin was like, and how the makeup of the galaxy may have changed over the material of the solar system's age. As I mentioned, since my last update at the end of July, there have been some new developments. The first is a study published by Santa Ross and colleagues that reports that the coma of the comet has reddened across July, the surface of the object was already known from previous data to be reddened, and a reddened surface of an object is an expected result of long-term exposure to cosmic rays, and in this case very long-term exposure to the interstellar medium. That Atlas continues to redden further indicates that its surface or its coma are evolving as it's getting increasingly heated by the sun, which is normal for cometary activity. The warmer it gets, the warmer the volatile ices inside it get, and then they flash into gas and blow dust off the surface, and that forms the tail. Atlas is interesting here because its tail is actually currently forming a strong spike towards the sun. This may seem strange at first, tail should be blown away from the sun, not towards it. But it actually is known cometary activity, and it's called an anti-tail and it happens when the ice melting is preferentially heated by the sun in the direction of the sun. So it's like having a geyser of gas shooting out towards the heat source warming it, which obviously is the sun. This will probably further evolve as the object gets warmer and warmer as it enters the solar system further, as it gets nearer to the heat source, at which time it will form a more conventional tail. How extensive that tail might be remains open. Comets can flare up and do all sorts of interesting things as they heat, because the volatiles in them will get exposed differently as it passes through. Maybe the sun will expose a large reservoir of ice and it will brighten until it exhausts. Or maybe not. You never know what you'll get from comets. Another interesting observation was done on August 21st by NASA's Sphere X mission, and it found a water ice emission and a very strong carbon dioxide emission. As an interesting point here is that it did not see a water vapor emission, but that may yet turn up with more heating because when the observation was made, it was right on the line for that. On the 22nd, the Lowell Observatory detected cyanide emissions from the object, and while a tentative observation, hydrogen cyanide emissions are normal for comets. Interestingly, however, on the 21st of August, the very large telescope confirmed the cyanide emissions but also created somewhat of a new mystery in that it detected the metal nickel in the coma of 3i Atlas. But it did not detect the usual companion to nickel in comets, which is the usually much more abundant iron. Iron and nickel form together in supernovae and go hand in hand normally. You see this with the nickel and iron ratios in iron meteorites. Take the Canyon Diablo meteorite, which was responsible for blowing a hole in Arizona about 50,000 years ago, forming Behringer or Meteor Crater. Chunks of that small iron asteroid were strewn all over the surrounding desert, along with quite literally a rain of molten metal droplets that can be picked up by dragging a magnet across the desert in that area. The ratio of nickel to iron in that meteorite is typical, about 7% nickel, and most of the rest being iron. Yet 3i Atlas isn't showing the iron, only the nickel, when the iron should be much higher. 
It also has a surprisingly high level of carbon dioxide outgassing versus water vapor outgassing, which is also atypical. In fact, 3i Atlas in this regard ranks among the highest carbon dioxide ratios ever seen in comets. Now to address the elephant in the room, it has been suggested that maybe the object might be a candidate for an artificial object of alien origin if certain key features had remained unresolved, such as the object's size, which could have been implausibly large and might have put alien activity on the table. But Hubble observations constrained that down a bit to a size normal for a comet. There was also the question of the angle the object entered the solar system at which is within a few degrees of the plane of the solar system, and that it makes close passes of three solar system planets and will be out of view from Earth when it's at perihelion, meaning we can't see what it does from our vantage point when it's at its closest to the Sun. Problem is, we can, because we have numerous spacecraft that can take a look at it, and I think it's a safe bet that if aliens wanted to hide from us, they were assuming that we had telescopes that could see their object. It's not a far stretch from that assumption for them to have assumed that we had littered our star system with active probes that could also see the object. But there's actually something more glaring here. If your goal is to see a star system as fully as you can to survey what's there, now is not that time. The most ideal recent time would have been the 1970s because of the grand tour alignment that we ourselves took advantage of to see four of the outer planets in one shot with the Voyager probes. If an alien probe had come in from the right angle and passed through the inner solar system first to take advantage of the alignment, it could have taken further advantage of other alignments for the inner planets and knocked out the majority of the major planets of the solar system including Earth in one go all at a time when we did not have the technology to easily detect such an object. Who knows what passed through unnoticed in the 1970s and 80s. More on the alien count has been made over the object's emissions, but this is not on particularly strong ground. An alien spacecraft probably isn't going to emit much more than heat and perhaps thrusters, which you would see some very odd chemicals if indeed it were doing that. There isn't any known reason to emit nickel and carbon dioxide like a comet. Yes, the ratios are weird, but it's not a solar system comet. It's an interstellar object with an entirely different history than anything we have. You have to give the object some slack for that aspect. So here the odd emission ratios probably are not speaking of alien technology, but rather unusual chemistry going on with this comet. That screams why this object is so important to study. It's already showing signs of being different in composition than a normal solar system comet is, and indeed for that matter, the interstellar comet Borisov. Given that this object is so old and showing unusual chemical characteristics, it's easily as interesting for its age as it is for being a sample from another much older star system with a different formation profile than the Sun had. You can also ask questions about what happens to an object that spends billions of years in the interstellar medium. Potentially in this case, it may have spent longer than the entire lifetime of our star system plying the intergalactic medium, especially the thick galactic disk where it originated from, encountering who knows what in that time. Star forming regions, nebulae, high density star regions, and so on. Can that change the chemistry and profile of an object? What happens if such a thing gets a little too close to a neutron star, or gets bombarded from a distant enough encounter with the jet of a pulsar to alter it rather than destroy it? Who knows, but it's worth wondering about the strange environments in the galaxy that this object might have inadvertently wandered through during its long journey. Or maybe it was a whole profile of different environments over a period of 7 billion years. That would get especially interesting if the chemistry remains odd, yet as we see more interstellar comets and their profiles with the Vera Rubin Observatory, brace yourself, you'll be seeing a lot of interstellar objects in the coming years with that telescope, and none quite match 3i Atlas. Or Oumuamua for that matter. It's at that point you have to start wondering about situations these objects might find themselves wandering into in the interstellar medium and what that might do to them to alter their chemistry. 
Another option is very long-term exposure to cosmic rays. That might give the comet a kind of shell on its outer surface that resulted in abundant CO2 ices. That shell is now melting, resulting in the high CO2 emissions. The nickel emissions without iron may be due to the grains coming off the comet being made of nickel tetracarbonyl, which is not stable and breaks apart into nickel and carbon monoxide in UV sunlight. That might explain the high activity, but weird attributes of that activity, of the object so far from the sun. Oddly, if this is something left over from the formation of the object, it reveals where in its protoplanetary disk it formed, which would be very distant from its parent star. And then there is the question of what chemistry was doing earlier in the universe when abundances of elements were a bit different from when the solar system formed. The scientific questions here are endless, so the natural question is what can we do to make as many observations of the object as we can, get a solid profile of its chemistry and behavior as it passes its whole trip through the solar system? And most importantly, what can we do with all these probes out in the solar system to make observations from different vantage points of the object, and when we can't see it from Earth at all? The answer is exciting. In addition to multiple observations done worldwide already that will continue, along with more Hubble and James Webb observations in November and December, the spacecraft list that can do meaningful observations of 3i Atlas is growing, as the scientists think about what they can do. While the door may still be open to use an aging Mars probe near the end of its mission to go out and intercept it, one door has closed. The Juno mission at Jupiter is finishing up and getting ready to take the plunge into the atmosphere to destroy it so it doesn't crash into any moons and potentially contaminate them. It was pointed out by Loeb and colleagues that if Juno had enough remaining fuel, which they didn't know when they authored the paper, it could have done it but it's since been clarified by the Juno team that it doesn't have the fuel left to make the trip. The probes at Mars remain open, but specifically the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, MRO, is capable of taking measurements from Mars. But there are two missions heading into space that might yield useful observations. One of them is a Psyche mission on its way to the asteroid 16 Psyche, and is designed to study the metal-rich composition of that asteroid. And there is the JUICE spacecraft on its way to the Jupiter system that can do observations. JUICE is interesting here because it underwent a gravity assist at Venus on the 31st and is in a solid position to see Atlas at its perihelion. JUICE is the one to watch, especially here. Also at Mars are TN11 and HOPE, both of which have the vantage point and suitable equipment to take data on the object. For comparison, the closest approach to these spacecraft is about 28 million miles for Psyche, JUICE around 43 million, and Mars is 18 million. For Earth, the closest it gets is 168 million miles on December 19th. Closer views are better, of course. There are also other options as pointed out by Marshall Eubanks, ESA's SOHO Solar Probe and NASA's Punch Probe, and indeed the Parker Solar Probe, might be able to do observations that give a day-to-day -day look at Atlas, albeit at low resolution. While in less opportune positions, Hera, Europa Clipper, and the Lucy spacecraft can't do much, but there is an odd possibility that after the comet passes through, they might end up going through its tail and may be able to take measurements of that. But we don't know how this comet will develop, which greatly defines those possibilities. So there you have it, 3i Atlas continues to cook through the solar system and remains of high interest. But it's me, and I can't not point out something odd. So I leave you with this. Remember Zhabilsky's star, with the strange signature of transuranic elements in its makeup that remains a very large unsolved mystery? And in fact, so strange, it's an alien technosignature candidate. Well, one of the hallmarks of that star is that at first, Antony Zhabilsky could not detect any iron in the makeup of that star, which immediately made it anomalous, or an impossibly early star. Iron has since been detected in the star, but at very low levels for any star that exists today. The star is a member of a class of stars called peculiar stars because their chemical makeups do not match most other stars. Is it possible, just perhaps, 3i Atlas was born around just such a star. Food for thought.
Thanks for listening. I'm futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently feeling kinship with 3i Atlas. After having endured many long transcontinental plane flights, none of them lasted 7 billion years, but imagine the jet lag and day sleepiness Atlas must be going through. Get that thing a cup of coffee. What, don't we have any hospitality in this star system? And the journey only ever stops if it gets captured by a star or plunges into one. Being an interstellar object is not for the faint of heart. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.